welcome, Luke. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you to a meeting of the Society. Um, so Luke Keogh is a curator and a historian who's passionate about plants and their stories. And today he's going to talk to us about his uh, new book. And I've got it behind, beside me, but I can't show it to you because it's lacking the cover. So it's not. Um, yes, me too. <laughs> there it is. Um, the Wardian case, it's also the, the, the uh, title of your talk, um, The Wardian case, How a Simple Box Moved Plants and Changed the World. And it was published uh, last year in 2020 uh, in the UK by Q Publishing. Um, the book also recently won the Excellence in History Prize from the Council of Botanical and Horticultural Libraries. Uh, and it was also listed as a top 10 book for of 2020 by the American Horticultural Society. And I'm really delighted that we can have this uh, talk about our uh, in the Linnean Society as part of our Nature Reader series because of the connections between uh, Ward and the Linnean Society. Um, I had a quick look on our archives and libraries catalogue before uh, before the talk, um, and I can see we've got, uh, and I knew we had material, but I, I wanted to remind myself what they were, so we have in particular his correspondence, Nathaniel Ward's correspondence, so he was elected as a fellow of the Linnean Society in um, 1817, um, and I think at least that's what's on the archive catalogue. Um, and so we have his correspondence. We also have six of the uh, society papers, as we call them. So papers that were submitted by um, fellows to be read at meetings of the society. And uh, we have uh, so six of these manuscripts, but mostly, and I think this is, um, in a, in a way, if we were in the building, uh, we would be able to, or you would be able to see while you talk, uh, the big oil painting of Nathaniel Ward, which is situated at the back of the meeting room, as uh, the people who have joined meetings in the, at the society in the past would know, um, because it's a, it's a big, large painting. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased uh, that uh, you were able to join us for this talk, and I'm really, really looking forward to it, and over to you. Wow. Um, hello, everyone out there. And um, thank you so much for having me all the way from um, Australia. Um, so I'm in uh, Geelong in Australia, uh, close to Melbourne. And uh, but um, because of these wonderful things such as Zoom, we get to um, do this online. So um, how, what I'm going to do today, I'm going to talk through a bit of a presentation um, with lots of fun images. And then um, over a few moments, I will dip into a little bit of um, uh, reading from the book um, where I can. The funny part was, is just before I was jumping online, I started to look into the Linnaean Society as well, because there's so many connections with Ward and um, I got a little bit sidetracked and I was running a touch late. So I apologise to Isabel and Padma, but I was doing things related to the Linnaean Society. Um, anyway, I will share my screen now and um, we have a few slides on there and then I will begin talking. All right, um, so as Isabel kindly introduced me, um, I have published this book. It's called The Wardian Case, How a Simple Box Moved Plants and Changed the World. It came out last year, roughly, but um, due to all of the things that have happened, it's probably most likely not hit any circulation until early 2021. Um, so, where do we begin? Um, let's begin with the picture that um, Isabel was kindly talking about before. And so many of you may have seen it hanging um, in the Linnaean Society. This, this is not the color one. This is a black and white uh, lithograph that was taken from the color painting, but this is Nathaniel Bagshaw Ward. He was a member of the Linnaean Society. Um, he was a medical doctor by training and uh, he came across this idea in 1829. So let's um, let me backtrack a little bit. He was a passionate naturalist. He, um, from a very young age, was very keen on searching for plants and these sorts of things and collecting. This is the early, um, early 19th century. And he became a medical doctor, but continued his passion with plants. At this time, it was very common for, let's say, an amateur to be well connected in natural history circles. Um, so well connected was he that um, 
his friends uh, put together through, uh, um, all put their money together and they paid JP Knight, who then painted the oil painting, which now hangs at the Linnaean Society. So I think that's of how well respected he was among natural history circles in London at the time. So why the Wardian case and why Nathaniel Bagshaw Ward and why is such a box named after him? Um, all very interesting questions. Um, but um, I'll try and be brief. I know that um, time is upon us and um, there I have written a whole book about this. So um, I'll run through things quite quickly, allow for questions at the end and um, I'm more than welcome for you to reach out through to me through the website if you have further questions after this. So let's get into Nathaniel Bagshaw Ward. Ward in about 1829, in the summer of 1829, he was really struggling to grow plants at his house. He lived at Wellclose Square, which many of you will know, uh, is very close to the London docks, to the St. Catherine docks, a short walk from there. At that time, in the 1820s, it was a very polluted, um, lots of activity, but very polluted factories around there. And it was, would have been a very difficult place to grow plants. Now, he, in 1829, he came across this idea of, he was trying to grow a, I have my water bottle next to me, but I'm gonna use it as an example. He wanted to grow a moth out of a, um, get a moth to grow in a bottle. And he put the moth in there and he put a few plants in there and he closed the lid up and he was waiting for the moth to hatch out of a pupa. He, the moth hatched and he let it go out the lid. And then he realized inside it, there was a fern growing. He thought, wow, this is a fern that I can't get to grow in my house um, or in my garden, yet inside this bottle, it's growing quite well, um, even though all this polluted air is happening and all that sort of thing. And so he took this experiment and he expanded that experiment. So from 1829, when he first hit upon this idea, for many years, he started experimenting in his house. And this was um, a fascinating part of of him as a as a as an amateur scientist he was experimenting he was growing plants under glass he was growing all varieties of plants under glass in his house over that period of time he was very good friends with a number of people one of the really important ones was george lodges who ran the uh, famous lodges and sons nursery in um, in hackney sorry i knew it began with h um, and so together with Lodges, they said, well, if this idea of growing plants under, under glass in an enclosed system um, is so good, maybe we could send plants overseas using this system. Lodges ran a nursery, a well-known nursery that moved plants um, to various locations around the world, in particular to Europe. And so they thought, let's, let's try this out. And so what um, they did in 1833, they said, well, let's make a box, let's seal it up under glass, uh, very similar to this one here, which comes from Ward's book. Um, and then let's send it on the longest journey then known. Uh, this was to where I am, to Australia. And so over four or five months, ship traveled, left St. Catherine Docks. It was called the Persian. Um, a very, Captain Mallard was the captain of the ship, a very good friend of both Ward and Lodges. And they sent it. And sure enough, by the time they got to Tasmania, um, the plants were still alive. Actually, halfway through, the plants were doing so well that Lodi just had to open it up and trim some off the top. They then went on to Sydney and um, they arrived at the Sydney Botanic Gardens. The curator there um, took the plants out, was very happy to have these plants at the Sydney Botanic Gardens, and then put more plants back in. And these plants were then sent back on the ship and back to London. And when they arrived, they'd been through various different temperatures, they'd been below zero, they'd been very hot and humid conditions, but again, these plants survived the journey back. And when George Lodges and Nathaniel Bagshaw Ward went on board the ship, they realized that they saw the, the growing fern of Glycini microphylla, which had never apparently never been seen in London before, and they proclaimed it a, a success. Now, what's really fascinating about this is this was this precipitous moment in which, let's say, a technology had proven itself and that it was, it was viable. 
Um, over the previous century, and I'm happy to answer questions on this, the idea of the box uh, was well known to naturalists. They were using boxes to move live plants all around the globe, uh, but not a sealed box. That was the new invention that Ward contributed to this ongoing use of boxes around the world. Now, why was moving live plants important? Well, as many of us would know that you can move seeds and that's a much easier way to move them, but some plants can't be moved to seed. They go, they're oily, they go rancid quickly, or other plants um, may not be seeding at the time when you would like to move them. So what Ward was able to show is that you can move live plants, which is quite important if you're trying to move plants around the globe. Okay, so uh, this is Ward. I also came across a really interesting part from a book and I thought it'd be quite interesting. So at the time when this experiment happened, when they sent plants to Australia uh, in 1833, there was also two Wardian cases, two experimental Wardian cases sitting in the Linnaean Society, which I think is pretty cool, which I kind of forgotten about until this lecture today. So it says, um, I'll read a section from a book just because I think it's quite fun. Um, on 4 June 1833, at the meeting of the Linnaean Society of London, Ward announced to the world Ward's experiments with plants. He told them of the finding of the fern and the glass grass in the bottle. He told them how he placed the bottle outside his window for three years. He told them how he'd experiment with other plants in different cases. And he went on to say, I have the pleasure of submitting two of my boxes to the inspection of the, Lin of the Linnaean Society. So while Ward was testing his plants, traveling over around the world, he was also presenting them to the Linnaean Society, which is quite interesting. Okay, I should move on um, because there's quite a bit to get through. Okay, so what is a Wardian case roughly? What do we know it as today? Um, there's two varieties of Wardian cases, as many of us will know. There's the terrarium style. There's the, the beautiful glass cases that sit on dining room tables. We would, these days, they're most likely like a terrarium. And there is also the traveling style cases. And much of my book and much of my research has been about these traveling style cases. And these look very similar to these ones, these two here. Um, the one on the left here, this is from the Berlin Botanic Gardens. And the one on the right is one of one from the um, Royal Botanic Gardens Q. Um, over to my left here, I also have a replica Wardian case, which I have at home. And when I can present in person, I often bring the case so that I can show people. Um, these cases themselves. Now, one interesting thing, I'm also a curator as well as a researcher, one interesting thing is there's actually very few of these traditional traveling style cases left in collections around the world. And that's um, one of my motivations for starting research for the book, but it's also an interesting line of inquiry that um, I get into much more in the book. So these are the sort of cases that I was um, focusing on in the research. And these are some of the ones that are still available um, to be viewed. One interesting part of it is we can see that there is, a, it's a timber box. It has um, glass inserts on the side of the box and then plants are planted inside of the box. Now these can either be planted directly inside, they can be put inside with um, in pots or in, every, in a variety of other ways. Often in later times, they had feet on them and these feet were then able to be um, keep it up, or up off the ship deck when they were being transported. And so when sailors would wash the ship, they would then, um, the salt water would run through. And salt water was one of the really big challenges for moving live plants is that, and one of the great things about being enclosed in cases is that live plants weren't getting sea spray on them anymore. Okay, so one of the things I focus on with the watering case is how it moved live plants around the, around the globe. So there was transporting live plants, um, one of the focuses of, of my research has been on traveling style cases, as I've already told you, and they were used by many different people. And this is one of the really fascinating things. So Ward was an amateur naturalist. Um, he was very well connected, but he was an amateur naturalist. He was a professional doctor, and that's um, 
how he was making his living, but his passion was natural history. There's also a lot of other people using them, whether they were plant hunters going to different locations, whether it was uh, uh, nursery people, whether it was um, people in far-flung locations, such as indentured labourers or native peoples, using and planting plants, digging them up, using Wardian cases, sending them. So there was this whole network of people around the globe which plants were moving to, coming back together. They were used for over a century. So from when the first use happened in the 1830s, they were used right through until the 1940s. And they moved a whole range of species. So, one of the really interesting things about the Wardian case is it was really pivotal in moving a number of really important species. And so some of them, um, the banana was moved um, well before the Wardian case uh, was invented, but it became really important in the 19th century of moving the banana to various locations, in particular the Cavendish banana. Um, the Wardian case was really important in the transport of tea from uh, China to India. We know that Indian tea is um, tea is native to India, but there was an interesting transport in the 1850s with Rob Fortune, which the Wardian case was this really important technology that proved that a tea industry in India could be uh, possible. Another really important one is Cinchona, the transport in the 1860s, the Wardian case was used to great effect to move plants to various locations from its native home in South America over to India where it was grown and then to other locations such as in Java and other places. And then we also know that Wardian case was really important in the transport of, um, of rubber, of the rubber plant Brasilia hayensis. So that was really important in not, we know that we can move the seeds, but once the seeds had propagated at queue, the Wardian cases were then sent out to varying locations. And these are just four examples of some really important economic plants that were moved in Wardian cases and how important it became in setting up colonial botanic gardens, um, in setting up plantations and these sorts of things. And we also see here a range of different workers who are working away at moving plants or packing Wardian cases, whether they be children or other people in different locations. Some of the intellectual framework for the book was based around um, doing creative things with history and the histories of plants. And so one really important thing was to follow a box on its journeys. To, to, so to follow Wardian cases was um, kind of fun because people usually focus on environments or people or these sorts of things. But we kind of, in much of the book, I'm following different boxes and who's moving them and how they're moving around the globe. Um, as I said before, I'm a curator as well. And so one of the things that curators often ways that they look at things is to look at people and stories, but we also look at objects and how these objects um, can help to tell stories and, and reveal important historical stories. Um, one really cool thing about the Wardian case is that when it was invented and when it was promoted, in particular in London natural history circles and also in European natural history circles, it was this important technology that not only was provided the means to move plants, but it also provided the possibility that plants could be moved from different locations. And that was really important in, in colonial times when setting up plantations in different locations, um, very far from the periphery, from the central locations, that was quite important that there was a technology available that could move plants. And then one of the conclusions I come to is that the Wardian case not only just moved plants, it moved a whole range of things that we don't really know about. And they, some of those implications are still with us today. A lovely part of the book and um, what I work through in it is to look at people we don't often represent in our stories about botany and plants. And that's um, nurseries really fundamental to um, understanding plants, but also to moving plants to various portions of the population, um, whether that's the middle class or the lower classes or the upper class. Um, amateurs and the important role that amateurs play in moving plants. So
no had strong connections but didn't have a botanic garden at his, at his service or these sorts of things and he was able to have such wide influence through his invention and the other interesting part of the research when I was delving into the Wardian case was to find how many quite beautiful plants and um, whether they were roses or fuchsias or begonias, there were so many of these plants moved in Wardian cases. And for a while I was wondering why were these plants moved? And it becomes a function of sending plants to the colonies, these beautiful plants to the colonies, and in return, um, unknown plants were sent back to places of um, central locations, such as Cuba Botanic Gardens or the Jardin des Plants or places like this. Okay, um, I've been told to talk for um, 50 minutes, correct me if I'm wrong. So what I was going to do is, a, um, one of my favorite parts of the book was um, one of the parts where I conclude on Nathaniel Ward. And I was going to read just a page or two about Nathaniel Ward, Nathaniel Bagshaw Ward, about his house at Clapham that he moved to in later life and um, how he ended his days. And this is really forgotten part of the story. We often remember Nathaniel Ward for inventing the Wardian case in 1829, in 1833, this wonderful um, experiment that they did to send plants to um, Australia, and then the promotion of the Wardian case throughout the 1830s and the 1840s. We often forget that um, he continued to work as a doctor, that um, he was very passionate about plants and forget about who he was as a person. And so in chapter six of the book, I really do get into that. And so, I'll just start with a brief section from chapter six, and then I'll move to um, a couple of concluding parts, and then we'll jump back into the presentation. But this is a picture um, from um, Ward's house in Clapham, uh, the greenhouse there, and it's an interior view from 1851. So I'll begin. Um, Nathaniel, Nathaniel Ward's door was always open. Whether welcoming plant hunters such as Robert Fortune or leading botanists such as Joseph Hooker, Ward's home was a sanctuary for naturalists. One could always be assured of a meal and good conversation. There are also many new and interesting plants to inspect, either under a microscope or growing under glass. Ward's friends and contacts continued for years to send him plants. Joseph Hooker described Ward's home during the whole period that I knew him, and I believe for many years before, his hospitable house, first in Wellclose Square and latterly in Clapham Rise, was the most frequented metropolitan resort of naturalists from all quarters of the globe of any since Joseph Banks's day. This is the success of Ward's invention for moving plants cannot be separated from his networks. The very name of the box, the Wardian case, cannot be fully grasped without visiting Ward's hospitable house. Okay, I'll jump forward a little bit, but it's so revealing that Ward had this house that everyone wanted to go to, and this was, he, he, his house was somehow like his botanic garden. It was the center of his network in which then information about these cases spread out through all these well-known scientists, people like Joseph Hooker or Asa Gray in Boston, all these people. Okay, I'm jumping forward to near the end of the chapter. This is where Nathaniel Ward uh, passes away. In the 1860s, Ward continued his work at Chelsea and in his garden at Clapton. Because time was upon him, he resolved not to have any more plants sent to him. Quote, I had made up my mind not to purchase any more, but the temptation was too great, he said about purchasing more North American ferns. Like all collectors, he harbored an overwhelming desire for new plants, a desire to hold the exotic, to plant it and to watch it grow. Although he maintained friendships with like-minded people in faraway places, he never had the opportunity to visit them. He always wanted to see India after all the things White had told him. And Gray, Asa Gray in Boston, continuously asked him to visit Boston. The farthest trip Ward managed to take was to the continent but he contented himself with his garden at Clapham. Spending time among his plants from around the world, knowing their stories and their collectors, knowing the distance they had traveled toward him. He says, my great delight, however, is my little garden, 
reminding me of many kind friends. He surrounded himself with the rhododendrons Joseph Hooker sent him from India, the ferns Gray sent him perfectly packed in cases, the Arctic plants a friend sent him from Norway, the algae von Mueller sent him from Melbourne, and the cycads Stangus had sent him from the Cape Colony. In his last years, Ward grew increasingly disgruntled. He had already outlived his wife and many of his children. His daughter-in-law died and left his son with a three-month-old daughter. Another son whom he had encouraged into the medical profession was overwhelmed in his duties at the London hospital and suffered a breakdown. Finances also weighed upon Ward. For all his tireless work, he had little to leave his children. His investments before retiring did not yield their proposed returns and he, almost, and he was almost destitute. In 1865, friends who had achieved far greater fame than him, William Hooker, John Lindley and Joseph Paxton all passed away. In the end, his garden was his last pleasure. The Wardian case that he had so vigorously promoted had given and given to the public was a particular disappointment. His reflections were penned on Christmas Day, 1866, and are worth quoting in full. So this is a, this is a letter that Nathaniel Ward wrote to Asa Gray in Boston. 33 years have elapsed since my first cases arrived in New Holland. You know what has been affected by them since. I have never received the slightest acknowledgement or thanks from any public body in this country independently of having had hundreds, I might say thousands of letters of inquiry to answer and all my leisure time and more than all occupied in receiving visits. From in too many cases, idle and ignorant people who were tired of their lives for want of something to do. But were my time to come again, I should do precisely as I have done, considering that my life, though one of constant labor, has been one of great delight. And that's Nathaniel Ward, 1866. All right, one small little bit more, if we can. There are many personally signed copies of Ward's book on the growth of plants in closely glazed cases deposited all around the globe. There is one signed to Ferdinand von Mueller at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Melbourne, another at the Grey Herbarium at Harvard, and yet another at Kew Gardens. But maybe the notations in Ward's personal copy speak volumes about him. He inscribed his copy with a quote from the old spectator. The quote reads, the consciousness of approving oneself a benefactor to mankind is the noblest recompense for being so. There was the argument against glass tax and the prescription of Wardian cases for the poor and the insistence on the on the possibilities of his case for betterment. Nathaniel Bankshaw Ward died at St. Leonard's on Sea on 4 June, 1868. He was survived by two daughters and a son. When the Morning Post reported his death, the headline said simply, inventor of Wardian cases. The short obituary captured his career in only a few comments. There was an outpouring of obituaries and praise by his friends for the Wardian case and his tireless efforts. Joseph Hooker described him the most useful and pleasant correspondent he had ever had, going on to say, a large portion of the most valuable economic and other tropical plants now cultivated in England would, but for these cases, not yet have been introduced. Okay, so that's from chapter six. So about halfway through the book, one interesting part of um, what I try to show in the book is that the, the Wardian case outlived its inventor. And so what's very fascinating is the life of the Wardian case post 1868, when Ward passed away. And this is something that I try to capture as well in the second half of the book is to, well, yes, it was invented. Yes, it was named after this person, but how was it used post 1868? And What's really fascinating is it was used even more, it was used even more widely, and it had even greater impact. And so to, to some of those stories that I'll go into now um, for the next um, 10 or so minutes. So 
some of the really important people that began to use it, the nursery trade. And so they were one of the big uptakes on the Wardian case. Interesting enough, um, William Bull from Chelsea, he also in 1869 uh, tried to patent his own invention. It was called Bull's case. And it looked very similar to a Wardian case. It was never really um, taken up very often very much, but um, also interesting to see those designs. Um, but the nursery trade was really important. And this is also showcasing of a, an emerging middle class who had a fascination with plants. And so to get more plants into places such as London or into European centers and cities, um, plants had to be moved and exotic, new and exotic things had to be found. And so the Wardian case was used to move these plants, to move lots of these plants and to help in this process. We also know from research, more recent research, that the nursery trade had a large impact on moving um, invasive species and plant pathogens and these sorts of things. The other big group of movers was botanical institutions. So this shows um, the Jardin de Sa Coloniale prepared, um, preparing Wardian cases in Paris. Um, we know Royal Botanic Gardens Q, the Horticultural Society, Royal Horticultural Society. Um, major botanical institutions used the Wardian case widely. And so it wasn't just the Royal Botanic Gardens Q, it was a whole range of places all around the globe that were using Wardian cases to send it out, primarily for, um, for research, primarily to understand what native plants are growing in far flung locations, as well as sending out economic varieties of plants that could be used in plantations, in um, colonial botanic gardens, they could be propagated and spread out to colonists, or as well as to send out plants that reminded people of home. That's what I talked about before. Roses, foxes, these beautiful plants. Okay. So if we're interested in how these plants are moving, one thing you would think it'd be quite easy to track is how um, the Wadian case moved around. And really challenging thing for a historian looking at a box um, is that the archival material related to the box is uh, very challenging, is that most people chose to record, most botanic gardens chose to record what plants were moving. Very few botanic gardens chose to record whether they came as seeds, whether they came in Wardian cases or whether they came in boxes or how they were arriving. And so this is, so we don't fully know how many Wardian cases were in motion. We know there was thousands of them, but we're not fully sure. One great source of that information is of course the archives at Kew because they have these wonderful books, um, these inwards and outwards plants books that have um, listed if plants are arriving in Wardian cases or not. Um, quite a special resource, that one, um, and even have little pictures drawn in there of Wardian cases with the list of plants that were coming in them. Anyway, that's a historical um, geeky point of mine, but anyway, fun. So here in this graph, we see plants that are coming into the Royal Botanic Gardens between 1840, uh, 1842 and 1865 in the reign of um, William Hooker. And the bigger the arrow going in is the larger the number of plants coming. Sorry, you can't fully see that because of, um, I can't see it on my screen anyway. So a large number are coming from the colonies, New Zealand, Australia, um, and these sorts of places. But then if we go to the next one and we see which Wardian cases are going out, we see that while there's a limited number of locations where Wardian cases are going back to the Royal Botanic Gardens queue, the Wardian cases that are going out are going out to far, far more places that are, than that are coming in. And this is a fascinating way to see the global transport of plants from just one botanical institution. Um, what's fascinating about looking into those cases is that what's being sent out is often useful plants, so economic varieties of plants, but also a lot of ornamental plants. And that kind of fascinated me early on. And then, um, um, I started to do more research into that. And what is coming in to Royal Botanic Gardens queue, and this one is often unknown foreign varieties of plants. So 
New plants that are being discovered are often being sent back to be classified at these centers of botanical um, research. Okay, so we've got um, nurseries we use in the Wardian case quite a lot in the post, post 1870s. Um, botanical institutions were using them a lot. And in this phase of high imperialism between 1890 and 1910, the Wardian case usage spikes again and increases again. And this is when uh, colonies are being set up in many far-flung places around the world. The French are using the Wardian case to send economic varieties of plants. The Dutch are sending them out. Um, the Royal Botanic Garden, the Botanic Gardens in Berlin are sending out huge numbers of um, Wardian cases of economic plants to their colonies as well. And so we see in these three examples, three different, not just the British sending them out, but other places. So we've got the French sending out or using Wardian cases. We've got the Dutch, and we've also got the German colonial interests as well. And so this was a really important moment in the movement of plants. It's also an important moment where plants become, let's say, uh, institutionalized. And it's also after Ward's death that we see in about the 18, late 1860s, 1870s, that the time when an amateur such as Nathaniel Ward could be so well connected into uh, botanical research slowly comes to an end. And it's in these times of the 1880s, 1890s and 1910s that the Wardian case is used by researchers in botanical institutions or colonists or nurseries. And so there's a large shift in how we're starting to understand and use plants and send them out around the world. One interesting case study I follow in the book is the United States Department of Agriculture. And I found this quite a fascinating one. Um, for a lot of the research I got to spend, I was living in the United States and I started to do more research on the United States element. I found that the United States Department of Agriculture was using the Wadian case quite a lot. And um, one of the, the tensions coming in the early 20th century is between the movement of species on one hand, so moving all these plants around the globe, whether that's economic plants or finding new plants and sending all these species to different locations. And on the other hand, the emerging understanding that by moving all these things, there's actually quite a lot of pests and invasive species and plant pathogens that are starting, that are in flow. And this, these two tensions sort of can be traced in various locations, but are, no, are most apparent when you look at the United States Department of Agriculture, because on the one hand, you have the entomological department who are understanding all these invasive species that are coming and that are impacting upon um, economic crops. And then on the other hand, you see um, people such as David Fairchild, who runs the botanical research uh, section and they're sending out plant hunters all over the world and bringing back all these varieties of plants. And so this comes to a head in the 1920s. And um, an interesting side note, um, when the book was first came out, um, this is early this year or late last year, um, I was talking to my dad about it. And I said, when I was writing the end chapters of the book, I really wasn't sure if people would understand the word quarantine. And it was questioned in, when, when, when I wrote it and then, I th then I said to him on the phone, well, I think people understand what quarantine means now. And so this was one of the really interesting parts of the research. We start to see that when live plants come into a country, they are then quarantined. And one of the reasons, and I mentioned this earlier on, is that we have so few of the Wardian case in collections around the world, is that they, when they arrived at locations in the 20th century, the plants were taken out, the soil was taken off and often these warding cases were disposed of because of the possibility of having plant pathogens in them or having invasive species in them or something in them. They were disposed of whether they were burnt or whether things were done with them. And so we begin to understand that plants have come full circle in some ways. And this is captured in a great quote from Beverly Galloway, who was at the USDA. 
The Wardian case has probably been the means of scattering more dangerous insects, nematodes, and other pests over the earth than almost any other form of carrier. Hence, its use is not advised except under special instructions. Um, so we see this, this arc, this, warding, this technology, this warding case is so amazing. It moved all these really important plants. It helped to kickstart so many important crops. It moved these beautiful plants that people took so much pleasure in. So it was this amazing technology that moved live plants and mobilized all these global plants. In the 1920s, we begin to see that, well, we've moved all this stuff, but it is causing problems. And so how do we negotiate that? And um, what's really fascinating, and this is the last major use of the Wardian case, which came in the 1920s, 1930s, was to use the case, because it was a sealed, largely enclosed environment, you could move, um, you could move insects in them that would be traveling, use them for biological control. You could move insects in warding cases to different locations, which would then feed on the invasive species that were in those locations. So one of the fascinating examples to bring the story full circle is the prickly pear problem in Australia in the 1920s. And the prickly pear is, grew out, is a cactus variety and grew out of control in Australia. One of the ways that this was brought under control was with the cactoblastus moth. And the moth was moved from Central America in, as this picture shows here, Wardian cases and taken to Australia. And so I just found this a fascinating example of showing how um, one of the last stories of how this box had an impact was to solve problems of moving too many plants in the first place. And these ironies are what environmental historians often talk about. And it's a fascinating way to understand long-term environmental change. So I hope um, I have um, not bored you with the talk and I hope you enjoyed reading some elements from the talk, um, from the book. Um, I enjoyed, um, thank you very much for having me here because I enjoyed um, dipping back into it and finding all these elements about the Linnaean society, which was super fun. Um, but we can see that the Wardian case was this global move of plants. It, it was used for transporting live plants. Um, much of what I'm talking about is these traveling style cases. Um, and we see that even after Nathaniel Ward's death, it continued to be used around the globe um, by many different people using them. Um, and that's about most of it. And if you want to know more, um, you can probably read about it in this book. <laughs> so. Thanks so much, Luke. That was, that was really great. Um, so as we wait for people to begin asking questions, uh, um, Isabel, do you want to go first? Sure, do yes. I, would you like me to stop sharing or would... Um... No, no, just keep that. It looks good. Okay. Um, thank you, Luke. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I really like how you've... It's like a his object-based history that is actually key um, to, to, so, to, to explain some of the... Uh, especially the economic expansion of the of the British Empire. And uh, yeah, I'd, I've, I've, I've loved reading the, the book and it actually ties in with quite a lot of other collections we have um, in the Linnaean Society. So I, I do have a couple of questions, but maybe maybe a, <laughs> maybe we should start with the ones that are actually in the Q&A book. So um, we have Jackie who asks, um, did Nathaniel Backshaw Ward uh, patent his invention or and or did he make any money from it? Um, I'll let you reply to that one. There's a, there's a follow-up question after that. And I think that's that's actually in your book, isn't it? Um, I, I, yeah, great question. Um, I, I probably should answer this because I, I get it a lot. Um, no, he didn't patent his invention. Um, he promoted it widely. As I um, read that section from the Linnaean Society that um, he was very well connected. And so he told various different people about the case, but he was, um, that's who he was as a person. He believed that this, invention could help move plants around the world but he also believed that it could help people in in England and in London in particular who were living in really challenging conditions so one of the things that he did do is he promoted that the Wardian case could be used to plant plants inside people's homes 
as a restorative thing as well. He was one of the big advocates along with, sorry, a name escapes me. Um, I wanna say John Lindley, I'm pretty sure it's John Lindley from the Royal Horticultural Society who advocated for the removal of the glass tax. And there, so in the UK, there was the glass tax, which was very challenging to build Wardian cases because glass was so expensive. And so when they removed the glass tax, you were able to build more Wardian cases, but also you could build a greenhouse, which is also cool. So one of the biggest advocates was the Gardener magazine, which um, promoted the removal of the glass tax quite heavily. But anyway, to go back to your short answer to your question is no, he didn't make any money out of it. And no, he didn't patent his invention, but he offered it for the good of the world. Um, thank you. And, and Jackie continues saying, what was Dr. Ward's relationship with Chelsea Physic Garden? And did the committee at the garden help assist him with the development of the Warden case? Ah, uh, yes, sorry. I, some questions, I there's, there's a global focus of the book and Sometimes I forget my audience that I'm speaking to and you're very much a London-based audience. And yes, he was heavily involved with the Ch Chelsea Physic Garden and he was heavily um, super important in, in working there, but also in reviving it when it almost uh, failed. And so, yes, he was very important. Whether the Physic Garden had a role to play in the development of the Wardian case, I would say, Yes and no. We know that they used it very early on, but I think it was probably more Ward's invention and in discussion with other key people. I would say probably the influence of Hackney and um, George Lodge's nursery is probably far more important than that for the invention of it, but certainly Ward was a, a, a key individual in the Chelsea Physic Garden over, its, over his lifetime. Uh, I have a question, Luke, if that's okay. Um, sure. You talk about transfer of technology, which was, of course, the, you know, uh, the clear case of T and how Robert Fortune moves the technology. Well, without permission, I would say it was more like stealing rather than um, allowed uh, transfer. But I was, and you had this wonderful photo in the book, um, not a photo, I, I was it a photo of a group of people looking at a petunia, or was it a rose? No, no the Hopley, yeah, yeah, the Edward Hopley um, painting, yes. yes. Yes, the painting, and it was, it's a room full of people, for people who haven't seen it, they're all gathered, gathered around. Yeah, that's the one, um, if you can see it I on the screen. Um, so I was wondering if you came across any stories, because plant or botany to such a large extent dominated what we drew or what we photographed, you know, our first idea of art. So, I mean, what the stories are, it is also an aesthetic transfer. It's not just technology transfer, but it's a transfer of art. Um, yes, I would say uh, uh, I mean, amazing if point. Across, if, yeah, if you looked at that part of the, you know, cross border. With Probably not, um, certainly the aesthetics of it were very important. So the idea of what types of plants were moved was really important. So if, and this is what I was talking about with these um, roses and fuchsias, these sorts of plants, is, it's, it's kind of strange that they were moved in Wardian cases because they could be moved any other way, but they were put in Wardian cases to send out to the colonies because people wanted these plants that reminded them of their um, European um, roots and they brought them out to colonies and these sorts of things but you're talking in an artistic sense and um, I didn't explore it so much in the book but I do see where you're going I think it's a great point um, for follow-up research I think um, yeah but the Hopley image that you do talk about it I, I would just digress a touch because it's a fascinating one where there's this apparent story which is not it was hard to fully verify, but this Hopley painted this image that you're talking about after hearing a story of 5,000 people lining the Melbourne streets to see the first primrose that arrived in Melbourne. Um, and this was the, um, and it arrived in a Wardian case. It was taken out of this Wardian case and apparently um, as a procession through 
was in Melbourne. Um, I'm not sure if it's true, but um, does make for a great painting and a great image from Hockley. Yeah, um, I love. Sorry, Isabel, go ahead. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. I was just going to go on with the, some of the Q&A. Is that all right, Padma? Yeah. Um, I think we have uh, Jeff who's asking, is there a catalogue of Ward's plant collection? Oh, um, no. Um, I would love one. Um, but um, so Ward's um, archives are spread quite widely, much like the archive of the Ward case as well. So there is no catalogue of Ward's plants that would be... Um, uh, amazing. I think it'd be quite difficult to find, but um, these days there's some amazing online resources where you can learn more about Ward and his plants. So some of the quotes I've taken from uh, his correspondence with Asa Gray, who's the, um, the Harvard botanist, and um, this is a beautiful correspondence that's on um, Biodiversity Heritage Library, um, and so that's that's a great place to look at that as well. But um, a, a list of his plants, no, sorry. I, well, I haven't come across one, but I'd love to see one. If anyone wants to reach out to me, by the way, um, uh, just it's just luke at lukekeo.com or just go to my website, lukekeo.com, and you'll find my email address. And happy to talk plants all the time. Um, well, actually, in, in terms of archival uh, research, Ray Heaton just has a comment that says some of the Victorian orchid nurseries around London have good surviving archives and may have information on Ward's cases as well. Um, but there's a couple of questions uh, that relate to the, the kind of practicalities of the Wardian case on, uh, on the ship. So um, Alison Norman asked, were some cases kept heated in any way? Um, not that I was able to um, see in um, any any of the research that I've done, um, but how that so they were often um, the cases were then put on a ship's deck and they were put on the poop deck of the ship, which is the high part which gets lots of sun, um, and the cases were enclosed and the sun would hit the um, the sides of the glass and then the transpiration would create this um, in environment on the inside of the case. Um, they weren't heated. Um, and the fascinating example about the first movement of a Wardian case was um, that it went through really hot conditions um, when it crossed the equator, but then it also went through really cold conditions as it was coming up the Thames into London on its return journey. So it went through all these varying environments, but because of this enclosed system, there was, uh, it, it was able to be kept relatively okay for the plants. But also remember, I, I think I discussed this in the books that yes, it was very successful, but there was still quite a few plants died on journeys as well. Um, yeah, I found that fascinating, the, the difference in temperature that you describe on, on the one, one voyage. Um, and uh, there's another question, was it an entirely closed system or was there a need to add water during the long journeys? Yeah, I've, I've been emailed a couple of these questions as well. It, it was certainly not hermetically sealed case. It was certainly enclosed and, and the original instructions from Ward was that um, this can remain enclosed for eight months on end. There's a lot of correspondence that says that realistically there was, the, the success was also due to a good ship captain who would take special care of the, um, the plants, not necessarily opening them up to water them throughout the voyage, but often to make sure that they were in a position which was okay and um, that they were look they were the positioning of them was looked after by the, the the crew in some ways if they needed to open them then someone may have opened them sometimes but um, there's also reports of they would sail out um, out of the London docks with this with the warning cases on the poop deck and then as soon as they were out of sight, they would all be picked up and put down below deck. And then when they all got back to their location, they, they came out. And so there's often reports of, well, how did these plants die? And they were like, well, they may have been under the ship's deck for a little while or something like this. So, yeah. Because they were taking too much space. Taking too much space. And then you've got these large boxes which are in, um, uh, in the way, I guess, mm. as well. So. Um, thank you. There's a few more. <laughs> There's a few more. Uh, Susanna Linden says, uh, looking forward to reading the book. Do you look at the relationship between the Wardian case and, uh, no, 
uh, I don't know how you pronounce this in English. In French, I would pronounce the P, but uh, it's uh, Terridomania. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the fern craze. Yes. Yes. Um, in some ways, um, but there's another very good book uh, called The Fern Craze. Sorry, the name of it escapes me, which I would encourage people to read also. So loosely, yes, but I'm more focused on Ward, the technology, uh, the Wardian case and how it moved plants around the globe, especially in a um, traveling mobility context. But the fern craze is covered by quite a few other people, Sarah Whittingham and David Allen's books are probably the best ones on that. Oh, Padma's just put the link to that in the um, in the chat. Um, and then there's um, the Romita Ray, hello Romita, uh, who's probably joining us from the other side of the world, uh, says, uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. Two questions. Um, to what extent was Nathaniel Ward and his Wardian case involved with Joseph Paxton's design for the Crystal Palace? Uh, they, they, they certainly um, met each other. Um, there was certainly when Paxton was designing the Crystal Palace, uh, someone who was working on the project went towards house to see the construction of a case. Um, but the probably the bigger connection was that the Wardian case was used to move plants when Paxton made his first big greenhouse for the for Cavendish because I know the bananas named after him. Um, please help me, my um, English colleagues. Um, um, uh, neither Padma or I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is, um, is this well Chatsworth? Um, yeah, oh, I, yes, I don't want to say something stupid. <laughs> no, I should know the answer to that. Um, Paxton worked there as the head gardener. I know the whole story and created the greenhouse. And to fill that first greenhouse, um, the Wardian case was used to move the plants, such as orchids and um, and uh, Amherstia nobilis. I know my pronunciation is wrong, but to move them to this first greenhouse. When, and so that, that first greenhouse was Paxton's first try at it, and then he expanded it out to the Crystal Palace. But the Crystal Palace was also fundamental in bringing down the cost of glass, which then helped in the um, um, further use of the Wardy case because then glass became cheap and easily to manufacture in a large industrial context. We've got lo loads of people coming in say, yes, this is Duke of Devonshire in chat for Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, and then uh, Romita's second question was, in your research, did you find any evidence of Wardian cases transporting plants in and out of the botanical gardens in India, Kolkata, Darjeeling, et cetera, uh, beyond Robert Fortune's tea transferals? Oh yes, lots, and it's an amazing story. And um, part of the reason I, I wasn't able to go there personally to those locations, and I would like to go there sometime soon. But yes, um, used um, substantially for them. This image here is in India, at um, where the first cinchona public um, plantations were set up. This black and white image in the background here, and. You actually can't see it. They're all the plants there that are in the um, in the pots. But to both sides there, there's two Wardian cases that are open, and um, they. This is the earliest image of a Wardian case that we know of from 1865. Um, but yes, there's plenty of um, use of the Wardian case in India, and it was a very important for the colonial botanic gardens there, um, in particular. Thank you. I've got just one comment left in the uh, question and answer box. Um, uh, and the person said, this is just by the way, um, Nathaniel Ward was also a founder member of the Microscopic Call Society of London, now Royal Microscopical Society, founded at a meeting of his neighbor, Edwin Queckett in Wellclose uh, Square in 1839. Um, and he adds the, uh, or he or she, sorry, uh, adds the Lodige's father and son were also present, but you, you're mm -hmm. nodding. So. <laughs> it is, I, it's cool. Yeah, that they were part of the micros, microscopical society. Um, yes, they were. I think Ward was the treasurer, is that correct? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but yes. Yep. 
I think. Um, before we go, yep. I just one quick question. Did you ever visit his um, greenhouse in Clapham Rise? What's there now? Did you ever um, find out? I, I, it, it's not there now. There, there's a there, there's an apartment there, but um, yeah, it's it's not there as such now. But yes, I I tried to go there. Um, also to his house at um, Wellclo Square, um, and then you just walk to the docks and you realise how close it was to the docks, which is quite um, crazy. So yes and no, but I'm not sure if there's many fragments left there um, of his life and that sort of thing, but please let me know. I'd love to know more. Yeah, that sounds like a good walk. Um, somebody in the chat box has said he needs a blue plaque. He definitely does. The, the, oh, yeah. Yes, yes. No, and there's no blue plaque. I should put that yeah. there. Yes. Yeah, that's a shame. We could all petition for one. Um, I think that's it for today. Thank you so much, Duke, for joining us from Australia. And thank you, Isabel.